what it does is to convert one form of power into another, electricity. Come into one of the largest turbine halls in Britain and see what is happening. Those machines below us are turbo generators where electricity is actually being made while we watch. We can't see much from up here, so let's pick one generator and look right inside it. As you remember, there are two parts, a set of fixed coils, the stator, and a big electromagnet, the rotor. Electricity is generated only when the magnet is moving, and so we must have power to turn it, a great deal of power. Let's see what form of power it is that drives the generators and supplies us in Britain with our electricity. At the other end of the shaft which turns the generator is a turbine. The turbine is really a very efficient mill with wheels which may be driven round by the power of steam, wind or water. We are all familiar with the power of the wind which for centuries we have harnessed to drive mills. However, the power of the wind is limited, and so far we haven't succeeded in generating much electricity from it. The power of falling water also has its place in the history of man's search for power. And we have harnessed water power very effectively, but only in mountainous areas, where there is a sufficient fall for the water. In most of our power stations, like this one, electricity is generated from steam power. To produce steam, we need two things, water and heat. We site our power stations where there is water. The heat comes from fuel, a form of natural power, which is one from the earth, and coal, oil, or more recently, uranium. So let's see how the engineers make steam and control it so that it will do work with the highest efficiency. This power station uses coal. Every day, more than 3,000 tons of coal are brought in five train loads and shunted into the sidings ready to go into the power station. low-grade small coal that is unsuitable for most other purposes. The coal must first be ground into a fine dust or pulverized in these mills before being blown into the furnace in a jet. The finely powdered coal burns quickly in the furnace to give large amounts of heat. Then heat and water meet in a large boiler above the furnace flames. The boiler is made up of many tubes all filled with water which has been treated to avoid scale forming. As the hot gases circulate between the tubes, the heat makes the water boil. Steam is formed and rises up through the tubes to a drum where it is collected at a very high pressure. A high pressure is needed because in that way a great deal of power can be stored in the steam. It then goes on to a superheater where every last ounce of energy from the coal is stored in the steam by raising it to a very high temperature indeed. Both high pressures and high temperatures are necessary if we want our power station to be efficient. Thus the steam has immense power when finally it leaves the boiler and rushes in a controlled blast through pipes and into the turbine. The steam first enters this end of the turbine where there is a main stop valve and a governor which regulates the speed. Then it goes into the turbine proper which is in two parts. The first section is called the high pressure cylinder. Inside it, the full force of the steam blows through a number of those wheels we saw earlier. Set in the edge of each wheel are little blades called vanes. As the steam strikes the vanes, it makes the wheels turn very fast, usually 3,000 revolutions a minute. In doing this, some of the power is used up, but there's still a lot left as the steam goes on into the second part of the turbine, the low pressure cylinder. The low pressure cylinder is really two turbines in one, for the steam enters in the middle and is forced out through two sets of wheels. 
turning them 3,000 times a minute also. Finally, the steam is sucked out of the turbine, for in this way we can use every bit of energy it contains. Under the machine are big condensers where the steam is cooled very quickly with water. As it is cooled, it condenses and creates a vacuum. To fill this, more steam immediately rushes through the last few wheels of the turbine. Then this, of course, is condensed in its turn, and so the process goes on. The steam condenses back into water, which, because it has been specially treated, is pumped back to the boiler and used over and over again. The cooling water, meanwhile, goes back to the river. If there is no large river nearby, cooling towers are used to cool the water before it is discarded. Thus, steam power becomes mechanical power, turning the shaft of the turbine which is coupled to the generator. Here, the power is converted into electricity in the large quantities needed for our public supplies. So you see that great demands are made on our fuel supplies by the power station. Some stations burn oil in a furnace in the place of coal, while a few smaller stations use oil to drive diesel engine generators. In our new nuclear power stations, the heat comes from uranium, a radioactive element. Apart from this, the process is the same. We raise steam power to drive turbines simply by using a different fuel. Here's a load of uranium arriving. That is the equivalent of five train loads of coal in that one coffin, as the container is called. So you can see that uranium gives a great deal of heat from a much smaller quantity of fuel. The uranium has been specially prepared and goes straight into the reactor. Here at the loading place, it is charged by machine. The fuel is inside these cans, and when it's lowered into the reactor, conditions are such that the radioactive uranium gives off heat spontaneously. At a nuclear power station, the reactor is the equivalent of the furnace in a conventional power station. The heat released in it is passed on to a form of boiler, or heat exchanger, where steam at high pressure is produced. So the only thing about a nuclear power station that is different is the way in which we get heat from the fuel. Let's look more closely at the reactor. The first thing we see is a thick concrete shield. For as well as heat, the uranium gives off rays which could be harmful if proper precautions were not taken. Inside the shield is a graphite core surrounding the uranium rods. Here the breakdown of uranium atoms takes place and is carefully controlled. As the atoms split, the uranium becomes very hot. This heat is picked up by a stream of gas which goes round and round through the reactor and carries the heat onto the heat exchanger. Inside the heat exchanger are tubes filled with water, just like the tubes of a boiler. Heat from the reactor boils the water and the steam is collected at high pressure before being fed to the turbines. Meanwhile, something remarkable is happening to the uranium. While it is making heat, some of it is turning into plutonium. So the spent fuel is taken away, and after processing, the plutonium is used as the fuel for another type of nuclear power station. Finally, look at this turbine in a nuclear power station. Clearly, it is very like this one which we saw earlier in a conventional coal-burning power station. And in principle, they are exactly the same. In each case, they are driven by steam power. The electricity you use is, of course, the same, whether it is generated from water power or one of the three fuels, coal, oil, or uranium. Each of the fuels gives us power in the form of heat with which to make steam power to turn the turbines and drive the generators where the power is converted into electricity. So, as the whole
whole building converts one form of power or another into